So my name is Jeff Mucci with RCR Wireless News and we are here today to talk about network capacity planning and uh, how this core group of folks are going to help save the European carriers from the data tsunami and mobile video tsunami. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some um, statistics about mo mobile data usage and mobile video usage and I'm going to go down the line and introduce the, the panel and then we'll get into the details. So um, just how severe is the mobile data and mobile video problem? Here's some stats. Ericsson, the world's top mobile equipment manufacturer, says there's going to be a tenfold surge in mobile data video between 2015 and 2021, driven by, no surprise, YouTube, Facebook, Netflix. YouTube accounts for 70% of mobile, mobile traffic in many networks, and Netflix can reach 20% of network where network is available. 40% of YouTube traffic comes from mobile today, and that's up from 25% last year and 6% the year before. Half a billion mobile devices and connections were added last year globally. Half a billion. Global mobile data, this is according to the Cisco report, the global mobile data traffic grew 69% in 2014, equaling 2.5 exabits per month at the end of 2014 versus 1.5 exabit per month at the end of 2013. Finally, mobile Monthly global data will surpass 24.3 exabytes by 2020. So somebody, we ought to start with somebody telling me what an exabyte really looks like. But let's get started. We've got a great panel today. Uh, we've got equipment manufacturers, we've got fiber uh, providers, and we have um, a few specialists in wireless. So our first, uh, now I've reversed things here, but Jay Lawrence joins us, a uh, CEO of Nexcom. Raise your hand, Jay. Thanks, okay. Pete. He is a subject matter expert in ultra-broadband, high-performance wireless networking, um, powered by their own radios. Um, Nexcom delivers the highest availability and payload with the lowest latency, time to service, and cost of ownership, and have offices here in Europe, and I think there's going to be talking about more of um, plans for growth here in Europe. Our next, Craig Cubbon, not Cuban, but Cubbon down on the end, is Product Manager for Infrastructure Services for Hibernia Networks. Hibernia owns and operates a global network including connecting North America, Europe, Asia, serving 89 markets and spanning 25 countries. Rob Barlow, CEO of WireIE, they are an industry leader providing high availability, secure data over networks in rural and remote regions. We met last year. Interesting things going on in the Caribbean and the Tar Sands. Um, and they do specialize in vertical markets like oil and gas. And finally, Roy Purse is uh, in technical sales for XKL, which is a privately funded engineering company, and they explore and develop optical solutions and networks for data communications companies. And uh, the company, interestingly, it was uh, founded and led by one of Cisco's co-founders, Len Bosak. Is that right, Roy? That's right. Okay. So let's get started by having each of the uh, panelists. <coughs> I'm going to ask them a question. We'll talk a little bit about it, and then we're going to go into some general uh, conversations about network planning capacity, uh, latency standards, and that sort of thing. But we'll start out with Hibernia at the end down there, Greg. What impact will high-definition video have on um, on your network, specifically moving uh, data from the core to the edge and back? Sure. So we've obviously seen this enormous growth of mobile data and it's impacting um, how we start capacity planning our network. Um, I mean, just, just for the sake of, you know, what we're talking about with mobile data. I mean, mobile data is exploding as we know, but um, you know, a colleague of mine um, turns up with a 4K smartphone. Um, he's going to use it to watch his 4K videos on, but really is there need for such definition on a, on a, on a handheld? Yet it is putting a burden on the networks. It's, it's, it's available technology to use, so it will be used. Um, this enormous growth of bandwidth um, is also going to drive up the demand, I and mean, we know the pricing bandwidth continuously drops, but the demand is ever increasing. So we are going to have to look at how we um, get better efficiency out of our network and how we deliver that network. So there's a lot of change going on in the marketplace. I think things like SDN are a future technology that we would be looking at. Um, um, very much internally we are looking at you know, optimizing, getting more efficiency into the platform, getting better leverage out of the um, optical spectrum that we have. Um, you know, constant improvement, I think, is, is the message here. 
And of course that goes not just for the core distribution of what is the globalized data, it's also how we get that globalized data from the core down to the edge and down to the radio networks. So it's this whole expansion of the distribution of net data, not just for us, not just the core. I want you to tell us a little bit about some of the customers you're serving and what are some of their, maybe give us an example of uh, a customer's acute demand today. Yeah. Capacity. So, so very much, you know, we're seeing a big shift in, in our primary customers from the wholesale carrier market, very much towards the, the mega growth web centrics. So the, the, the guys that run the big search engines, the guys that run the social media sites, and we all know probably who they are. Um, but they are now becoming more the anchor tenants on systems than the traditional carriers that, that were in place. And they're, they're buying capacity in you know, unprecedented levels. So I stopped by, uh, we're here at the Data Center Dynamics Convention in, in, in London, and I stopped by the um, HP Enterprise booth yesterday, and they've got some custom-built um, servers and, and, and such for, and they disclose, you know, Microsoft, Apple, um, Facebook, and others. And um, I asked him, you know, how do you define where the carriers fit into that equation? Because he referenced tier one, their tier one customers are not the mobile phone companies, are not the telcos, they're really the, the what was the term you used, web centrics? Yep. Yeah. So it's a different, <laughs> the world has uh, got a new packing order. Yeah. Well, next let's talk about wire IE. Rob, yeah. uh, tell us, uh, you know, I want to get to the question, you know, what are some of the uh, constraints that you see in building networks in the urban versus remote areas? But let's start out by who are some of your customers today and what are some of the problems you're solving for them? Well, most of our customers today are um, tier one uh, carriers who uh, work with us on a wholesale basis. Um, they actually are still wor working with large uh, enterprise and government uh, customers. Um, they need to make sure they have ubiquitous SLAs and ser service across all entities and assets, uh, regardless of location. Um, YRIE is a company that uh, you know, works well in that space. We're focused on it. It's uh, an MEF certified net network, Carrier Ethernet 2.0. It's one of the only uh, carriers that have that certification for a hy uh, hybrid fi fiber-based network. And uh, we actually uh, are finding that our clients, uh, who are wholesale, are kind of in a transformation uh, with the web cent web centrics. You know, they're they're looking at who's our new customer. Uh, but for YRIE, it's, re it's really about maintaining that core base for wholesale um, tier one carriers and uh, making it uh, so that you know, things like video and unified communications and mission critical business applications can be used uh, with a high availability, low latency network. Got it. Well, Roy, let's uh, talk about XKL. Um, and I want to ask you a question about operating systems in a minute, but why don't we start with. Uh, you know, who are some of your customers that you're working with today and what problems are you solving for them? Sure. Uh, this year has been a record year, of course. Um, almost all of our customers have been data centers, either new data centers, extending existing data centers, uh, just new data centers, period. Uh, the unit of uh, purchase is 10 10 Gs. Um, we have 100 G products available, but there's not been no great demand this year because most people don't have 100G clients. So there's constant pressure to make better use of existing cable and uh, constant pressure to link up all of these, these new data centers. Uh, we're prepared for some very complex network topologies that we're not seeing them. People mostly want point to point. Sometimes they want something as clever as a loop. All the things we're prepared to give them they don't want. They just want something fast, low cost, easy to install, easy to manage fire and forget. And that's what our business has been this year. Uh, we, I'm surprised at the volume. We've had people write in from countries we've not got any presence in and say, we would like to order some for our data centers. And that is an unprecedented thing to happen. And I, I'm not sure I agree that with better efficiency we're going to be able to deal with all this because from my point of view, I'm seeing more than a tenfold surge. I'm seeing customers whose demand has suddenly doubled, or they think it's going to suddenly double. It seems to be out of control. Most of the requests I'm getting are for increased capacity now, and I know the Cisco long-term numbers. 
I don't think those are as important as the short-term numbers, what each customer is facing. Each customer is facing a peak next month. And uh, I, I don't know how guys are making these predictions. Well, during our pre-call, you mentioned that um, things can be introduced to the, the network that fundamentally can cripple a carrier's network. And you mentioned the Apple I, I, iOS yeah. launch. How did, what happened and how did the carriers respond to that issue? Um, the carrier does the right thing and gives, gets, does their best to get all the packets through. Uh, what they often do is buy over capacity to do that. Most people schedule their lines about 50%, so they've always got room for a peak. However, on some occasions, like when Apple introduced the last iOS update, everyone's peak got hit at the same time. So many people were upgrading their, their pads and stuff that uh, traffic got blocked, and it got blocked for most of the data center's customers, not just for iOS. And uh, I, the conversation we had was, how could you deal with that? And there are prioritization schemes that could be used, but they've not been necessary yet. But Apple never phoned everybody to say, um, by the way, Wednesday we're going to push this stuff through. And I just wanted you to know, it just came as a one. There have to be ways in the future of dealing with these out of control things. There is no management for the internet. And so we actually need uh, better traffic shaping. We need decent software uh, in the transport systems to actually um, give priorities and, and assert them when these bad things happen. It's not a bad thing for iOS to come through, but they could have throttled it back. It wouldn't have mattered if the iOS update had taken all night. You were asleep anyway. You didn't have to take two hours. <laughs> well, Jay, I want to talk about millimeter wave and how it relates to 5G, but first, why don't you maybe give folks an update on um, some of your customers, how you serve them, and what makes um, your service unique. <clears throat> yeah, sure. I, I know you mentioned uh, wanting to talk a bit about the uh, the Jersey to Slough route, which is an interesting uh, hybrid fiber wireless, albeit microwave, uh, not millimeter wave. And we, we really focus on wireless technology, not just millimeter wave uh, at its core, uh, just the difference being what level of spectrum you're playing in millimeter waves, the really high frequency stuff that's got lots of bandwidth, and I'll come back to that. Uh, but I think the, uh, uh, the route that we did via microwave uh, connecting New Jersey to Slough is the absolute perfect metaphor for one of the verticals we're in, which is the low latency training uh, vertical. Um, so we spent uh, a little over 12 months designing, building, and lighting that thing up, and it was the absolute, uh, you know, cat's meow in the industry for exactly 12 months, and then this guy came along with a cable <laughs> in the ground that beat it. So, um, you know, that is, you know, it's funny that when we first got involved with uh, uh, Jamie Scotto and her gang, one of the things that we had always preach is that fiber and wireless need to cooperate. So as you look at, you know, millimeter wave or microwave or fiber, and the statistics you gave at the very onset of this were really interesting, and I said this on one of these panels, I don't know, a year or two ago. Um, if you look into the 20th century, bits are the new drug of choice. I mean, it's the new cosmetic thing that makes us all happy. And for us, low latency, that's just cocaine. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you know, people are going to need that sort of drive. And when you advance it into the origin of your question of millimeter wave technology, and, and Nexcom has gone through an interesting evolution in terms of how we look at technology and its development. Uh, and what have you, and you know, day one out of the gate, you know, we were you know two guys in a truck effectively trying to figure out how to build wireless networks. You know, we have two pennies to rub together, but we figured out how to build a couple. And we built for uh, you guys about customers. I mean, AT and T is one of our first and remains one of our longest standing customers. We've done uh, the network for brands in Spaceport, New Mexico, uh, two very different applications. One was oil and gas. One was the spaceship's got to go up, and I want to know all about it. And then, of course, one of our key verticals where latency is essential is the other uh, trading application where these guys are just uh, clamoring for their bit before the next guy, and it's a, it's a pony race from uh, data center A to data center Z. Uh, millimeter wave is an interesting thing because in terms of satisfying, or be, at least being a, a drug dealer in the metaphor that I'm using here in terms of the, the bit distribution, it presents a really interesting tool in that the guys that are putting fiber in the ground, and Greg can talk to this, I'm sure, because I know he just went through getting his express cable laid it's not a small undertaking. I mean, you, but mind you, you got you know exabits or terabits or you know, pick your funny word and put front of word bits. <laughs> you got a lot of bits. Um, 
but I, I think what's important to know is there, there's a time to revenue and there's a time to difficulty uh, to get that done. Where I think millimeter wave is interesting is it can close a cost per bit to deployment time gap between the two as a real complement. Uh, and also provide a redeployability and expansion in that bandwidth because millimeter wave today is defined as spectrum between 70 and 90 gigahertz. Um, we have internal development programs going on and as again we've evolved, we used to build our own radios by hand almost in a garage and that worked for the year one but by you know, year five now it's no longer quite relevant. We partner with equipment manufacturers and started to work with them because you know resource loading and what you're going to focus on is important. But millimeter wave as it goes from 70, 80, 90 gigahertz to 120 and 240 gigahertz will have a lot of the same principles, but what will happen is inside of one point to point radio, whereas in our microwave solution that ties New York to Chicago and that Greg just kicked its butt, um, thanks Greg, um, you know, that was a 100 megabit service. That's 100 megabits for 10 customers sliced up into 10 by 10 slices. Today's millimeter wave is one gigabit. Um, tomorrow's will be 10, uh, but there is a clear trajectory to hundreds of gigabits per radio where you can imagine for a very low cost, meaning thousands of dollars, not, what did it cost? $350 million? $250 million for a transatlantic cable. Yeah. So for a couple of thousand dollars, I could put that same kind of capacity across the Hudson River and put terabits on groups of data centers and offer diversity so when the next Sandy happens or the next 9-11, God forbid, takes place, Things will cause the wires to go down to keep the wireless up. And as we talk about latency into 5G, the one thing I'll just add on a closing point is 5G or a small cell, whatever you call it, you're going to have density of devices in the network. And the denser the network gets, the more digital signal processing events you're going to have to go through. And at some point, as dumb as we are as human beings, we're going to notice it. Yep. <clears throat> well, um, by the way, we should thank Jamie Scotto for putting us together here at the Data Center Dynamics event. And it's interesting, this event, I, first time I've been here, but you walk, you walk the floor and it's a lot about data center racks and power and such. And what's really been interesting about attending Jamie's events over the past couple of years is you, you really get into the, the, the plumbing of the networks and the data centers and the colo centers and the meet me rooms. And even in the last three or four years that I've been attending, things have changed dramatically. And so I think next year if we come back here together, I think you're going to see more of the the, the network guys as part of this discussion. I hope that's what you see. But uh, thank you, Jamie, for, for having us. Um, while I'm in London this week, I've been visiting some other some of our customers, InterDigital. I went down to the uh, Surrey 5G uh, Innovation Center over to King's College and looked at some of the things they're doing. And the term that, that I heard more often than not was information-centric networks. That's uh, you talk about the web-centric guys that are really driving a different architecture. So. I'm going to put that into ICN capacity planning because that's really what the carriers are having to deal with is how to deal with all this information and how it's going to challenge their network. So I'm going to just open it up to the group and you guys can take turns answering it. But uh, how has capacity planning changed with this exponential growth of mobile data and video? I'm not sure it even exists. I was just going to say the same. Like, What's that? What, what it's, capacity planning? There is no capacity planning. <laughs> it's, it's, it's capacity reacting. Right? Yeah, right. yeah, that's and right. Yeah. Our, our job is always, okay, how, what's the biggest hole you have to patch and then how do you patch it? So then and it's best for the job. Yeah. And if something's incumbent, you pray to God you can get some of it. If it's not, then you figure out how to build it. Yeah. Uh, but it's highly reactive in most cases. I mean, even when we're doing spec builds for clients, um, to the point, the metaphor I brought up at the opening thing where we built this thing that took us 12 months, it was the state of the art, and then all of a sudden, 12 months later, it's a dinosaur. Well, now you've got a capacity react to that. Now, it's driven by a latency component, but how did the world change that much in 12 months? I mean, you think about you know evolution of technology, that's as diametric as it can possibly get. Uh, and that's one big network. All these other smaller metro networks are even that much more liquid. And I think I would spend probably better than half of my time listening to my salespeople or my engineers tell me what we got to do to optimize somewhere because someone's thought of something different that's faster, different, better, cheaper, what have you. And it's perpetual reaction. If you can ever get out in front, then it's almost like you're the deer that is in the headlights because now you don't know how you even got there. It's off, it could be awful lonely out there. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I, 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 I agree with absolutely all of that. And I, I would say, where does it end? Because uh, everyone knows people, and I've been one who says 100 megabits will never meet, need more than that, never need more than a gig, never need more than 10. Here I am at 10 tens, 100 is looking cheap, mm -hmm. and it just goes on and on and on. 
Uh, but the internet has changed and people don't realize. The actual way data applications are run on the internet has changed and they create more packets exponentially more. And all the old rules of thumb have gone. And I think we're actually in trouble. I think it's, it's possible to patch it now, but you're not going to patch the next one quite so easily. It's just getting harder and harder. Um, all the, the stuff my company sells enables people to make better use of the fiber they've got, but in the end, they've used all their fiber. In the end, there are constraints that the infrastructure sets, and we're going to hit them really soon. It's going to be a surprise. And I'm, I'm for announcing a new concept, the silicon footprint. Like when we were running out of energy, at least in Europe, I was born in England, just spent the last 25 years in the States, so I kind of got a foot in both camps. Um, but here, a carbon footprint, here in London, a carbon footprint is a, a very important thing. Here in the, in the States, less so. I've got the biggest red truck you can imagine in the whole world. My carbon footprint is this big, man. It's a man's truck. But maybe a silicon footprint would be a measure. The amount of actual technology resources you use. If you're going to use a 4K smartphone, uh, you should pay for it. Or at least um, be able to buy credits for it or something. Because this time 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago, people said, oh, what's the point of a carbon footprint? You know, we're not, we're not going to need that. But now we do. It's like everybody used to smoke, and now hardly anybody smokes. We're very undisciplined in the way in which we use data. I mean, I know with my digital camera, I'm generating tons and tons of data. I'm storing it somewhere. It's next to free for me. Absolutely. Well, I don't worry about it, because you know, no, it's no. there. You're behaving smartly. You're behaving like everybody. Just, yeah. you know, but those you, know, you always get an awful lot of unsolicited video being generated. You jump onto a web page, and suddenly you've got a load of little videos sc scrolling at you. It's unsisted, but it's there. It's what, what pages are you going to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too much information. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, if I could just add yeah. on these points, they're all good points. I, I think a uh, few things have to happen. First thing is carriers have to recognize that the customer comes first, and um, they're still going to want what they need, and they're going to. But they have to also understand uh, uh, from a customer perspective that. Um, the customer has to be educated that this is like your your, your water pipe. It's your lifeblood. One cy cyber attack against your enterprise can you know cause serious econo economic harm. Um, you know there is the whole education that has to go on. It's two way. I think that organizations that are agile that can rely on new te technologies um, that are not uh, going to have the attitude that the, the client, well, this is all we can do for you. Um, you know, we have this legacy infrastructure here, that's what, that's what you're going to get. Uh, I don't think that cuts it anymore. Uh, we just can't, as you know, the, the, the guys that you're talking to, to uh, when you were here, they're the future of, uh, you know, forecasting where we're going to go. There's no stopping that. And so I think agile companies, Companies that are working with the end customer to make them understand how important it is are going to help us manage our way from this because right now, today, and we've probably been saying this for two or three years, it's it's not a commoditized product anymore. It shouldn't be the, the cheap, cheapest thing. I can put in IP VPN, but heaven forbid if somebody downloads the software for a soccer game and I get, a, get some kind of virus attack or cyber attack because of that, that's, that's a big issue. So we have to really start thinking about capacity and, and, and how important it is. Well, the, the come back to the core question about capacity planning. Everyone here serves the, I guess, the carriers in one form or fashion. And I would argue that the web center guys are, are the new carriers because mm -hmm. the underlying um, communication software they're using, I mean, it's Erlang-based, you know, WhatsApp and that sort of thing. These are, these are communication software companies built as web-centric, hyperscale <laughs> companies. But, what tools are your customers using to plan for their capacity needs, and then what role are you playing helping them try to figure that out? And maybe start here, Rob. What do you? What yeah. Do you so think? we we basically um, our network is pretty ad, agile. It's it's uh, can be upgraded by um, software. Um, you know, you can go from five to ten meg for an enterprise. That's and we can do do that um, based on a maintenance window. Um, two two weeks from now, if you, I mean, if you came to me and said I, I want five megs today and I want ten megs tomorrow, I could say in two weeks that'll happen. That that'll happen uh, based on your change that you have to 
uh, look after with the customer. So I think that uh, it's really just the open di dialogue, uh, understanding your end client's um, you know, behavior, uh, what they really want to do, what they're planning on doing, and they may not even know, as we, we just talked about. They, right. they may not know, but I think if you ask the right questions, it may inspire them to know. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, a lot of, we talked about the web, web centric guys, um, they're basically buying wholesale um, because they're so big. And um, it's, they're big, com big companies and, yeah. and they're also sort of the tail uh, wagging the dog, which is the end customer to them, <coughs> consumers, lots of them. And uh, small, small, medium business. So it's a challenge, it's not gonna go away, but I think, um, I think it's a, up to us as, Providers of telecom data ser ser services to do more education, like a round ta ta table like this. So let's jump down if I could, and then we'll come back. But Greg, you guys are building, you know, quarter million dollar subsidy networks, and then you got your metro networks and yeah. your co-location centers, and you're serving your customers. You're trying to understand their needs, but what tools? I mean, how are they planning for growth? What tools are they using? So we we well we we. In the same situation that we're very reactive to what our customers are asking us for. We're customer driven in, in what we're providing and how we're bolstering up our network. Each year we go through a budget cycle and we look at what paths we want to upgrade from 40 channel or 8 channel or build new fiber routes in. So there's constant evolution of the network. Mm -hmm. um, there are, of course, you know, the metrics that we want to start looking at. And, you know, things like, you know, go back to we are talking about this as being the age of the customer. The customer wants immediate satisfaction with the services they get. They want a really good quality of experience. And so things like latency become incredibly important. Things like um, you obviously don't want any packet loss or contention in the networks. So all of this, all of this stuff, you know, you've got to met, you've got to provide the core network platform to, to, to ensure the full horizontal end-to-end -end delivery of the service has the main or delivers that quality of experience. Jay, Rob, or Roy? Um, I, yeah, I would say um, most of my customers don't know what their loads will be. Even though their planning cycle is short, they still don't know. Often their loads are dependent on them picking up a customer further up the line. And so they don't know their customer's requirements, so they can't pass them on to me. I think the days are long gone. I'm a mathematician. Five years ago, I could have done you a nice little exponential curve a bit like the Cisco numbers you get that show that you know, demand is creeping up with this beautiful continuous thing. And it is for the universe, but it's not for Luton. You know, it's not for in any one place a continuous thing, it's discontinuous. And you can't do a smooth forecast, it doesn't exist. On the other hand, I would say, you don't need to forecast for all the customers. Maybe you need to forecast in a stratified way. Your priority customers always need to get through. You have an SLA to work to. You need to forecast for that, and that might be easy, but demand as a whole is too much too lumpy nowadays, and nobody knows. I do know if you double the client traffic into a data center, the traffic between that data center and the next rises exponentially. That is so counterintuitive. There's no little clever piece of software I can give you that you can look at every now and then. <laughs> oh, next week we will need 4.679. Uh, megabits a second. It's not going to work like that. So I think the thing you're looking for is really like, I think, like me, you're a prisoner of your experience. There must be a way of forecasting it. There isn't. There isn't. That's, that's a, well, that's a great segue to Jason of things you do. And, you, know, you tend to be very specific about the problem you're solving and the, for the customer. The high yeah. frequency trader might be different than the yeah, my world's been blown apart because I thought Roy had that piece of software. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, a couple of things. So tools, you know, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, you know, one of the favorite tools that my customers use is their wallet. Yeah, it's a service um, it's an agreement. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of a you know service order form. Um, but you know, we try to find ways of making that dollar become at least useful and have return. Um, and it's interesting because when you, the way you just phrase the question, I think is is useful uh, in that if you look at our latency practice versus our data practice, there is an ability to plan more in the latency practice than the data practice because there is a deterministic nature to building low latency networks where right now I've got networks underway from Chicago to Seattle to connect to Tokyo via the Pacific Trans-Pacific uh, trans cables. 
Uh, I've got networks under construction right now from Stockholm up, you know, from London up to Stockholm. Uh, that will give us the NASDAQ OMX and then the Moscow Exchange. Um, and when you look at that with everything else that we've got under our umbrella, it becomes a pretty big, bad, low latency network. The thing of it is, in that network, because of the deterministic thing, what you always have to look at is the guy that's clipping at your heels trying to take one microsecond off your route, and all of a sudden, that which was was, was worth $20,000 a month for one guy is now worth nothing because they're one microsecond behind the next guy. So you do have a really unusual ebb and tide, but there you can plan. Um, if you look to our, our metro non-low latency business, and we've done some work with uh, the group at 325 Hudson. In fact, you and I met up on the group there a couple years ago when we were first doing a managed rooftop with them. Uh, we've done some work with Safety Data Centers and a few others. Um, and data centers, whether it's the trading guys or whatnot, we view as kind of really the epicenter for how telecom is going to be anchored because whether it's the cloud guys, the content guys, the carrier guys, they really just a bunch of computers. You've got to have some kind of a line drawing them to each other. And that's where, it, whether it's a latency event or a bandwidth event or both events, you're going to run into some issue where you have to be able to think it through. Now, if Roy had the software tool, then we could all go home and be I'm done. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm just going to keep blaming you that for the rest of the yeah, panel. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But um, as a practical matter, when we get into the low latency piece, that is, but it's such a hyper-specific niche because conversely, the latency guys don't care about bandwidth. They've learned how to take gigabit pipes and cram them into 10 meg. It's, it's almost like, it's the bipolar opposite. I mean, it's the yin and the yang of what everything else that we're seeing in the industry because they care about the, the velocity from A to Z. They don't, they figured out, okay, I can strip all this stuff off, you know, like Greg said, I'm taking all these pictures, and we don't know what, you know, web pages he's looking at, we, we don't want to know, but, um, <laughs> but these guys are figuring out how to strip everything off. It's right down to the it's, it's, it's the, it's the frame and the steering wheel and the gas pedal of the car and nothing else. They've, they've dropped the stereo, the sound system, the power windows, they don't want any of that stuff. Uh, but our data center customers are this guy, all right? I've got a bazillion Facebook things I need to post, and I want to post them now, and I don't, you know, the iOS can wait to do it, and I'm sleeping, but I don't want to. So you have that, you know, this, this really kind of behavioral component, which is, is humanistic. Uh, not to say that my trading customers aren't human, but they've got a very specific, right down the middle focus in that space that does just change the entire, uh, I'd say, framework for planning there. And you can plan that, but you're always planning the velocity, not the capacity. Um, so. And one good example, the millimeter wave, if I was going to go off and build the transatlantic thing that we did with uh, a year ago uh, with millimeter wave, yeah, I could have done a gigabit, but it would have cost so much money and taken, actually, I'd still be building it while he was beating me. So, you know, you have to look at those trade-offs as well in terms of how you plan it. Again, right tool for the job, which I think is an essential component when you're looking at, you know, how do you solve some of these problems. Yeah. Well, along the theme of uh, capacity planning, there's some other events circling around that uh, I'd like your feedback on how it's going to impact the current networks. First of all, Internet of Things. So um, um, not just the wearables, but the, the smart cities, the connected cars, the smart factories, smart healthcare, etc. How will Internet of Things impact the current infrastructure? And I'll maybe start here and we'll work our way down. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> Internet of Things I think is a great uh, business intelligence uh, application, um, but you know I've talked to CIOs of ma major oil companies, and you know you can have too much information. So the Internet of Things really it has to be controlled at the business intelligence side. And what are you trying to do uh, to solve business problems or or or, mo or monitor those things? But low latency packet loss and jitter are what really uh, Internet of Things has to evolve to. It's not good enough to have your da data transferred over the nighttime to your central office. It has to evolve to real time, and it has to be uh, planned out such that um, you know, you're know you getting what you need. And you're, you're, I, I always say, and, and you guys kind of touched on it here, <coughs> New technologies for de delivering access and, and networks between da data centers, uh, if they're efficient networks, um, you know, you can actually tweak them and, and, and react in a better way. And so Internet of Things, I think, is going to be all about understanding a client's business needs, and it's going to be very custom. 
Yeah. It's not going to be something where you're going to assume that everything's just going to be populated with the Internet of Things. Um, it's it's going to have to be planned out. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to ask a, a very embarrassing question of the audience, and you don't have to react. I'd just like you to think of the answer to yourself. What is the cloud? Just <laughs> Do you yourself fully understand what the cloud is? No, I don't. One guy just looked at his watch. So yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be good. Cloud is really somebody else's data center. I'm sending stuff to the cloud, I'm sending it to someone else's data center. What is the purpose of the cloud? It's a marketing label for a process that people will hope accelerates. What is the Internet of Things? It's a marketing label for a process that people hope will accelerate. And I'm not sure there's a need to connect my shoelaces to your shoelaces, you know? But there hasn't been before, because there's an assumption in Internet of Things that everything is connected. There's no reason. The Internet, in the Internet, everything isn't connected. The Internet is a collection of networks. The, this, my, my pad is not on the internet, it's on whatever local carrier service has, and then it goes to the internet. There is no internet of, of pads, there is no internet of things. I feel strongly about this because I'm partly guilty of pushing the internet of things idea, <laughs> yeah, and now I I'm changing, the, changing my mind about it. <laughs> uh, for the purposes of uh, today's discussion, it's not about connecting toasters, it's about the, what I would call the industrial internet where you're looking at smart cities and, and smart surveillance and first responder. Uh, you, you take China, for example, that's moved 300 million people over the last 10 years to the urban market. That's an acute problem. There's another 300 million coming. So you've got acute issues in, in major markets that are going to have to address transportation. They're going to have to address energy consumption. They're going to have to address scarcity of water and other resources. And, so the, the, the ability for companies like Bosch, G, GE, Siemens to start addressing these issues with inter, industrial Internet of Things, I think is a different question than connecting toasters and shoelaces. So it's a very real uh, world challenge, and all of you here at the table are going to have to address it. You, know, you guys are in New York City, that's where we met at first, the most dense market in the U.S. certainly, and if you try to use your smartphone there two years ago, a year ago, down at the Starbucks, you simply couldn't connect, right? So the caverns that are created by these tall buildings make it nearly impossible. And that drives the next question, which is small cell densification. But I'm kind of curious from you guys, uh, Greg and, and Jay, what do, you, what do you think this industrial internet is going to do for your business? And then how are you supporting your customers to prepare them for things like densification and internet of things? So. Um I'll kind of build on a couple of the other previous yeah. thoughts, uh, but I'd like to do with maybe with a metaphor because I think it's it's relevant, not to say what is the Internet of Things, but what's the effect of it? And yeah. the, that's when I talk to my clients that are on the data side of our business. It, what is the effect of all of this stuff? So when I first came out of school, I worked for a robotics company, and the lady who ran this thing was probably the smartest human being on the planet, next to Stephen Hawking. And she wrote a thesis at 22 at MIT and it formed this company, but it was based on human sensations. And the the, the rub of it was that if you Every sensation you add is not linearly additive, it's exponentially additive. So if you can see somebody, I can see you, okay, fine, that's one thing. But if I can see and hear you, then that's, you know, that's a whole up no level of experience. I would say that there's an impact when you look at the data side of all of these things that are, whether it's smart cars or smartphones or smart pads or smart toasters or it's surveillance, you now don't have an additive thing. Right, because there's some base level of stuff that's just always going to be passing through it, that you've got to plan for spikes and peaks and everything else. Otherwise, you know, most people think, oh, I lost my cell phone because the wireless is bad. Nonsense. You lost your, your, your cell phone because the backhaul's broken. You got thrown off because of bit problems. It had nothing to do with the wireless. It's connected just fine. But that is a perfect example when you start to look t to tack on to an incumbent network, the underlying capacity of it's going to have to be exponentially capable of handling all these things because they're not additive at a one plus one basis. What that means when you look at, as we play our role as a carrier's carrier, the metropolitan areas, as an example, some of the things that we are trying to do is figure out how do you escalate the science so that millimeter wave being one of the first things that you asked me about, and we've teamed and partnered with some folks that we think would be most useful in getting us to 10 and 100 gigabit radios where the cost of the radios isn't $50,000, it's $5,000. Yeah. Now your cost per bit per mile has 
geometrically change. And if you don't have that geometric shift, then all you're going to do is have a perpetuation of the problem. And the networking problem is not going to get solved by any one science. I mean, millimeter wave will be a tool in a very vast toolbox, um, as any wireless tool, because without its fiber complement and its satellite complement, um, it, it, will, it will fail. I mean, as, as well, you're going to have to have dense, layered, interconnected networks that leverage multiple media. Because one of the big things, imagine this, we're all driving around in our smart car in 10 years. You want just one medium control in that car going on the street? Because yeah. I sure as hell don't. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's wireless when it rains, you're dead. If yeah. it's fiber, there's an earthquake, you know, I hope your wheel's in order. So there's a real, real essential thing, but you look at the, at the cascading of all these matters, and it's not insignificant. Um, so I think that, again, that, that exponential experience component of human sensory level, when you take that and tack it on to what a network looks like. You have to take that base and then plan for level and level and level stacking on top of it and it becomes a bit of an uncontrollable difficulty because we don't have all the tools today. Yeah. And Greg, what kind of conversations are you, you have with your clients about either small cell densification or Internet of Things? Well, Internet of Things, I was going to say, you know, I've seen a lot of, lot of the uh, sort of Forrester and Gartner type information and say by 2020, so we're talking about sort of 50 billion devices at the edge, and it's a huge amount of data generation or, 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 or information that's just being generated. Um, and I, I like the sort of, you know, I've read somewhere recently about the, uh, the wearable technology, the Fit Band type stuff, and um, they actually, um, the seismologists actually looked at some of the Fit Band data, and it gave them more accurate readings than their current seismology information when an earthquake struck. Because people woke up, people moved around when the tremor happened. And so they got millions of data points mm -hmm. for that, whereas they only had a couple of thousand seismology monitors. Yeah. So this whole ability to have all these enorm enormous amounts of sensors around the world that you can then collect information from and interpret, so this whole big data is there, um, it's just a matter of what are you going to use that data for. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, there will be more clever things coming out of it, you know, it's going to happen, it's going to grow, we, we get more intelligent about what we're doing out there. And that might mean, you know, we end up, you know, having, you know, connected cows, you know, cows wearing wearables or, you know, whatever other animals out there that we can start monitoring the health of and tracking them and all the rest of it, you know. The smart hamburger? Yeah, smart. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, you know, where does it stop? Where does it end? And yeah. I think the, the, the end has to be uh, no, it has to be. There is, of course, limits. There's physical resource limits. There's, there's network resource limits as to what you can actually build out there. And of course, you know, as a core network, we've always got to provide the connectivity on the the fiber assets that we've got and into the data centers. And the data centers have power limits in each of the region. You know, there's there's scope and scale to it all. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm in danger of thinking that Jay may be right. I'm reluctant to say that, but Jay may be right. Right in the sense that. What will get done is what can be paid for. The wallet is the tool, and the effect will be only things that can add value will actually be implemented. To state it as a general technology issue, all of these things are potentially connectable, overstated. There will only be a subset, a subset of things that actually add value by being connected, and that's a much smaller subset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think to build on that for a second, I mean, I've joked at these panels in the past that our, our low latency practice is kind of our military and industrial complex. All right, why do we have cell phones? I mean, you know, Susie Q didn't one day say, hey, listen, Daddy, go to work and invent me a cell phone. The military invented it. You know, DARPA program. All of a sudden, we all have, you know, we're tied to these things like a dog to a leash. Um, but without the ability to have some economic way to generate the next thing, and I, I would expand upon something Greg just said. You know, 40 years ago, we didn't have fiber optic uh, in the ground. You know, Sprint built its first end-to-end -end thing in the 80s. Uh, that was cutting edge state of the art. Now it's yesterday's news. Um, I, I would argue that the things that are going to solve some of these problems don't even exist yet. And none of us here are probably smart enough to even think what those things are uh, in terms of transportation mediums, modulation schemes, silicon. I mean, I think your silicon footprint argument was a really clever way of, of looking at what does that mean. Because if you can make that more efficient, and invention will happen, but um, I would be steadfast that I mean, I'm a, I'm a, in, I'm a nerd in a suit. Uh, but I've learned long enough that uh, without money, the nerd gets to develop nothing. So you need the economic push to make it happen. And that's, you know, as, again, we all the things that we're doing in our data practice, 
we're all hatched in our low latency practice. But if you look at the cost per bit in our low latency practice, it's more than 100 times the cost per bit in our data practice. I wish that wasn't true. I thought that meant multiple in my data practice. Well, one final question. Um, you might talk about the Internet of Things. Machine to machine communication falls into that. And, and Rob, you work a lot in oil and gas. Um, there have been SCADA systems in oil and gas monitoring things for, for a yeah. long time. Yeah. What are you hearing from your customers about um, using LT networks or cellular networks or other types of networks to replace the old MTM sensing networks that exist today? And, and for going back to the ROI, what is the ROI on that? Why would they invest the money to upgrade to monitoring everything through a cellular network or a new type of, of network? Yeah, so I, I think they, they, you have to look at it from um, what you're trying to plan to do first um, and the benefit of that. And so uh, a lot of uh, my clients, clients are looking at low latency, high availability, net, high availability networks to deliver business intelligence. And that is really driving the type of private network and then access te technologies. Um, but also you have constraints like geography. So as an example, north of the 60th parallel in Canada and above, it's probably gonna be satellite. But where you can be close to a you know, cellular tower uh, that has fiber or you may, you may use LTE if the latency is okay, or you may build your own private nomadic network that's um, backhauled by the nearest five, five, fiber using microwave. So it all depends on what you are trying to accomplish with the information, but my clients are really using it to um, make their businesses more efficient. The price of oil went from 100 to $45 a barrel. Um, natural gas and it, LNG are all affected by capacity, so they're really looking at it as to how do I do what I did before more efficiently with big data. And so that's what really drives this whole thing, and so the total cost of ownership drives how much the investment is. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes left. I'd like to close on the discussion around standards. Um, so let's, let's talk about the role of MEF and, and, and standards going forward in this uncertain, dynamic world of mobile video and data. Uh, I'll start down there and come back. And, but or Roy, you can jump in on, on standards. Do we need them? <laughs> Most of my, I would say all of my customers are enterprises, and they're pushing ahead with new technology, and all, the, all of the vendors, including ourselves, are pushing on the technology. And the standards seem to kind of get engaged and join on behind. And I'm particularly thinking of real, the faster e Ethernet, the 100 um, GE that uh, everyone's been looking at recently, we have in products. Uh, yes, there is an IEEE standard, but it's not something that we all waited for somebody to publish and then read carefully and had meetings about it and then implemented the chips. Uh, sometimes the standards is, um, certainly for enterprises, is, is, is not something you necessarily wait for. The, the, the real pressure is to get something done that will work and stay stable in the time at the right price, right price for bid. And uh, standards, yeah, it should be, if possible, in line. But if there isn't a standard and, and we can still achieve interoperation, I'm not sure that many of my customers are going to use, lose a lot of sleep. They would lose a lot of sleep about compliance, not complying with safety rules, banking rules, those kind of things. Those are important, but I distinguish between that kind of standard and the technology standard of how many bits there are to the to the packet frame. I'm not, I'm not sure they're they're obviously necessary, but they're not sufficient to make technology progress. Okay. Well, I was just going to say that I, I think obviously standards do give you a baseline to work from, but they're not there keeping pace with technology. They're always going to be in catch-up mode. There's going to be new technologies, new things coming out that people will adopt because it just works like Ethernet against token ring. Ethernet was a far better chipset, far more efficient to implement and run. Old other technologies, some might argue were better, get left behind because the more efficient one will take, take it forward and that's the way it's going to continue. More efficient chipsets and more efficient technology will drive us forward and then the standards will catch up with them. 
eventually. But there's more and more products coming out, more and more uh, platforms as well. And so the, the standards need to be spread across. It gets a much broader portfolio. So yeah, they feel like more like suggestions to me. <laughs> 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 um, we could go into systems integration mode and uh, I can plug a layer one radio network into three different switches and have three different systems configuration problems. They're all gigabit ethernet, so I'm not sure, I must have missed a chapter in the book that says if you want to confuse your systems integrator, toggle this piece of code. <laughs> so um, maybe it's standard confusion, um, but I think it's more of a suggestion. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say that standards we kind of misuse the term. It's not about agreement, it's about alignment. And the reason standards exist is because we're a very complex world we live in. And the reason that we use standards is so that we can be more efficient at how we react. So uh, if I have a standardized way of doing things and I go to a carrier the next carrier and he has following the same standard so that means we're both in agreement on alignment to that standard which means that we can be certified quicker together the whole bit there's a whole layer of communication and education that doesn't have to go on which makes us more efficient to react better so i think that you know standards are are uh, very much so reactionary they can be i know some st standards uh, aren't um, but I think that, um, you know, it's necessary um, to have a common goal and to, you know, all work together to solve the same problem and, and, and kind of the standards bodies make that happen. Yeah, I think my observation you had for decades, the um, standard bodies in some way keeping the OEMs in check so the traditional carriers would want organized suggestions in K or for the for the OEMs to say, we need to build to a standard so we're less likely to get locked in. They still get locked in, but they, they're less likely to get locked in. What's interesting today is the web center guys, you know, the Googles, Facebooks, that are moving so fast and are so far ahead of the curve that they are stripping out anything proprietary and getting down to the bare metal to the, so that if they have a function they need, they develop something that is finely tuned to solve that function. You walk the floor down there and you look at what HP has out on the floor and they've got these white boxes that have been uh, manufactured by Fo Foxconn but the design specs came from the web center guys. And then out of that they derived a, a new product line, cloud line if you will, that's quote somewhat standards based but the standards are really set by the open source community or code that the web center guys contributed in. To the, 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 so is it, my question really is, is, is that a new world order for the way standards get built? Uh, kind of, you're shaking your head. I think you're right. what your view is. I absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah. I think that they're, they're reshaping the law of the industry and how the box manufacturers are responding. Yeah, like that, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of, well, if there's money, you can do a lot of things. Yeah. If you don't have constraints, so as an exam example, some carriers that are, you know, I'd say the Facebooks and those guys are starting to compete against these guys big time. Um, some carriers have a lot more responsibility though. Like the central bank in some country has to close at the end of the day. I don't think that if you follow the model that uh, some of these guys are following, they have that type of project or that kind of responsibility. So I think that it all involves with time. Everybody has their their value. Um, you know, it's good to have stuff outside of a sta standard that's uh, forward thinking, but we still have some serious constraints or, or things that we have to, to do uh, to make the economy work. We've got about five minutes left. I would like to pause and um, we've got a couple troublemakers out in the audience. <laughs> Anyone want to raise your hand and ask a question? Um, first and foremost, I think it was great. Uh, panel was wonderful. It's more a comment than a question, and perhaps, I don't know if you guys see this in the different geographies, but my, my sense is that as carriers, um, we're, we're in trouble. We, we need to rethink what we do and how we do things. Um, and the funding and the money right now is actually on the side of the web scale companies. 
who are investing, and if, if they don't reach a price point that they want, or if they don't have a capacity that they're looking for, they're just going to go off and build it themselves. They're not even going to buy it from you. They're actually trying to flip the market to say, we'll buy it, and if you want to come here and help me out to run it, then I'll pay for it. Um, th that's, those are some of the things that we're seeing. Um, and I don't know if you're, you're exposed to basically the same stuff uh, in the different geographies. Well, we see, um, we've got a couple of different models of revenue that kind of fit into different buckets. I think, uh, I think it was Greg who said it, you know, we're forced to be customer reactive because that's, and I also apologize for being the money-grubbing uh, capitalist pig who opened the money conversation is driving all things, but it, unfortunately it does. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'd sit back and talk about uh, daisies and sunshine and roses and we're going to still sit here and have the same problems, but we respond to what our customers look for. We, we started off doing nothing but bespoke builds. Our goal was always to become a carrier's carrier and enable kind of niche, very high performance type solutions and I think we've achieved that, but even to this day, even as I sit here and talk, we have projects going on right now that are capital builds where we'll get, uh, you know, kind of a, a penance on the backside for, for managing the thing. But we do that because there's other more strategic things we can still play. I think Rob was making a good point earlier uh, just about the difference between a bank and Facebook and the need to close at the end of the day. And if you look at the geometry issue of networks and the absolute need for layering through different technologies, different capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, that's the perfect example of where that kind of fits in. So I think. Uh, I don't know that I would say that we're in trouble. I just think we need to have open minds and be thinking less, uh, you know, old school, if you will, because, you know, 20 years ago was the green phone on the wall. They had the cord that you heard voices and you had the little rotary dial. And, I mean, today it's this. I mean, what's next? I mean, the implant in your eyeball? I don't know. Um, but it's certainly going to change. <laughs> I think there's no doubt that we're in a transformational stage. I mean, you know, there's space internet discussion. Uh, Elon Musk is going to actually, you know, develop a way to deploy satellites small and cheaply and fast uh, um, to, you know, develop a mesh network of s satellites. Someday it's going to happen. Someone's going to do. So um, we're, but if, but if you look at um, the two economic, one's a commodity play with many, many users, and the more people you have, the more power you have. One is a very finite industrial automation where security, privacy, my data is very important to me and I will keep it. There are two different things. And I think that, um, you know, slowly, if you're big, you're going to take more market share on the consume, consumer side of things. But if you're precise and listen and are more of a, uh, I want to solve your business problem, you're going to get more of the enterprise industrial automation type of business and there is investment for that so any other questions comments I was just going to say thanks in educational for me and uh, I've learned um, that there is no crystal ball and um, blame Roy for that one as you said but uh, it, the, the common question in any sort of interview status is that where are we going to be in five years time and from the panel, you've, you've already answered that, nobody knows. Would you agree with that? Where are we going to be in five years? I Older. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, I reckon we're going to be in the same position. We're going to have technology for now. It's different than it was five years ago. We're going to be up to here in chaos. We're going to wish there was a standard. We're going to be pushing ahead. The people who can pay for things will pay for them. The rest of the things will get ignored. And it will feel like it feels now. Yeah. And then they'll still be talking about the Internet of Things as well in five years. <laughs> it seems as if we're going down the line of charging per bit and, you know, it, it's more monetizing the, the, uh, the data than actually the, you, what you can put down there. Well, there's always a supply and demand story, right? right? You know, when the supply starts drying up, you can charge more for it. And so, as we said, you know, if, if there is um, a limited resources, be it in a, a, a certain cell of uh, connectivity or in across a core transport link then you know but prices think, will go up to respond to demand and to what people actually want and maybe that will help drive more discipline as what's actually being delivered over the networks. So it's the, the current sort of infrastructure that's in like the UK is already out of date so you know how long has that got and are we as soon as the uh, the lines are 
uh, dug up and put down there, digging up again. It seems that way on the roads anyway. It, yeah. It's just the change is going to happen yeah. faster than anyone would like. And even, even millimetre wave is, is going to be one of those examples. Great future right now, but in the end, there's going to be spectrum problems, line of sight problems. So, all kinds of problems that I don't understand the early <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but all, all, all resources seem to wear out, they yeah. fill up, and then we have to find a way of regulating them. Yeah. We either ration them on price, or we, we do something different, but it's, we'll always just, just be able to pay for it. Yeah, I think you hit the key word, though, it's a resource, yeah. and it's critical for us going, going forward, and um, it's not... It, you know, there is value in, in some resources. It shouldn't be a commodity slide if it adds value. And so I think that's kind of the, uh, the question. What is someone willing to pay for value? And we'd go, understand is every IT cloud, you know, there is an underlying real network there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Do you have one more question over yeah, here? Sorry, just finish. Thank you very much, that's been really interesting. Um, do you think it's going to have to be regulation then that comes in that will mean that carriers are going to have to change the way they think about the future? Is that the only way that carriers are going to have to start really thinking about making sure that they're efficient, that they're using all the resources in the right way? Because as you said, the carbon footprint, regulation comes in, so everyone has to start thinking about it. The well, silicon footprint, is a, that the kind of... Is yeah, that it's a hybrid. It's really a hybrid, in my opinion, because what you're going to have is you're going to have resources that as they become scarce or highly competed or sought after will have some level of regulation put around, or at least governance put around it, I think. But what you're also going to have at the leading edge of that is the new stuff that hasn't been invented yet that nobody understands how to regulate. And that's what's going to drive where we're going to be in five years outside of Boulder. But the the new things that happen, and, and I was kind of front and center in this uh, in 2001 when millimeter wave existed on a pizza box in San Diego, California, and hadn't been deployed yet, we went and petitioned the FCC for spectrum rules. We could have done what 60 gigahertz did, by example. It's a very similar type of spectrum consumption from a resource standpoint, but we felt, given some of the characteristics, it'd be good to have some governance for it. So we forced it onto the technology on purpose to optimize its use in a carrier-type network. Because without a license, you can't guarantee an SLA. Without an SLA, no one's going to pay for it because it's the downtime of that SLA, which is where the real money gets lost, not the, uh, not the expense of the hardware. So I, I think there's a hybrid with regulation and technology, and there's, I, I think there's always going to be a tugging of the, of the heart and purse strings in terms of you know what rules and when and how. Sometimes it'll be to make sure the technology works. Sometimes the technology will be so crazy. I mean, they, we won't know how to regulate it for some period of time. And I'm not sure either one of those are good or bad. I just think it's the perpetual fluidity that we live in. And I would add, maybe you'll see more of what has happened recently, where governments tend to regulate heavily on behalf of the people. And not necessarily, not, it's not necessary they should regulate heavily on behalf of the technology. The technology will find its own level. But privacy, data protection, security, they're not on in the technological equation, nor in the business model. It might need some supervision. But I must say, having an English heart and an American passport, the two things may get treated differently on each side of the pond. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a German singer? I do have a German <laughs> this, this has been a great panel. I will say that at this event, Data Center Dynamics, uh, other than the power discussion that seems to be pervasive, the other discussion is sovereign data privacy, which is flattening out and requiring data centers, albeit lighter versions of data centers, in virtually every country. So one of the things I've heard coming out of this event is every country is going to have their own big data privacy, which is going to drive more data center builds and more connectivity for all of you guys. So, but again, I think we've run out of time. Thank you so much, each of you, for your discussions. Great questions.